Hi everybody, Mr. Farmer here and welcome to AP Economics. Today we're talking about tariffs and how they would impact supply and demand. And we're also going to be looking at comparative advantage, but on the inputs side of things. All right, here we go. So first off, we start out with a supply and demand graph, but let's kind of break down some things. So uh, you see in the y and x axis the typical P and Q. But now we have the supply curve upward sloping it says DS. Now we domestic supply. A lot of times I'll just do S uh, for supply. It's assumed to be domestic or SD. I like to have my subscript be the, uh, the identifier. And then we have a demand curve, which is DD for domestic demand. Again, I just put demand there. And then we have this PW. That's going to be the price that the world can offer. And so we go straight across. And we can see this is actually the supply of the world, which means... Whatever domestic market you're talking about, not them. Okay, so it's going to be another international producer. And you can see we're going to deal with some Q1, Q2 type things throughout. So let's kind of go through this. So let's assume a domestic market is able to produce a good at, say, $10. So if it was just the domestic market, we'd have our $10 price. We have our quantity right here. But now we have this international thing. We're going to assume that there's free trade. There's no tariffs. There's no quotas. And they can produce this, another country, pick one, they can produce it for $5. So here's the question to you. As a consumer, let's forget national pride for a second, who are you going to buy from, the $10 good or the $5 good? The international producer. You want to buy for the right price for the consumer, you're going to buy it for $5. So what are some takeaways? the lower price the world provides is going to become the domestic price because in order to sell anything, all these domestic producers, they're going to have to produce it at this competitive price, this $5 price. So that becomes our new market price point. Okay, so at the world price, which is this competitive $5 price, the domestic supply is going to be this Q1 level because at this $5 price will go straight across. I hit my supply curve, and I'm going to go straight down. So Q1, that's going to be the domestic supply. Now, the domestic demand is going to be at this $5. The consumers would like to have purchased Q2. So they want to produce at this Q2. So there's my quantity of the domestic supply, quantity of domestic demanded. And so, so far, we've produced Q1, the consumers want Q2, and that's where you can see this imported value. So they're going to import Q2 minus Q1. Okay, so there's our setup. With that said, I said we're talking about tariffs, so we're going to add some stuff to this. So with free trade, we have this market, that's the one we just covered. Now, consumer surplus. Don't overthink this. We've talked about consumer surplus. We look at the consumers. What are they willing to pay? The demand curve. I'm willing to spend this amount of money. I get this amount per unit. That's how much utility I get. I only had to spend this much. That's great. Here's my consumer surplus. How about producer surplus? To clarify, we are talking about the domestic producer surplus. I've never personally seen a question on the international producer surplus at the AP micro macro college board level. I'm sure it exists. I've personally never seen this and I've been doing this for a little while. With that said, the producers are willing to supply this amount of goods. They get to supply it for this price. So here we have our producer surplus. It's already highlighted, but let's go ahead and do that anyways. So the total market surplus benefit is this yellow area and this orange area great. But we said we're talking about tariffs. So let's talk about that. So let's go ahead and throw on tariff. The government imposes an import tariff that's going to be a tax on the imported goods. So now, just like when we talk about supply and supply plus tax, now we have the world price and the world price plus tariffs. So we're going to throw on some other quantities on here. So we have a Q3 and a Q4. What does this mean? At this price, the producers are going to be willing to produce Q3. At this world price, the consumers, the domestic consumers, want to purchase Q4. So we're going to be importing Q4 minus Q3. Again, don't overthink this. Just go step by step. 
But let's go back to that consumer surplus. I was willing to buy it for this amount. I get to buy it for this amount. Now keep an eye on this purple area. That we used for our total consumer surplus. So here's our new consumer surplus. How about the producer surplus? I was willing to produce it for this level. I get to produce it for this level. So here's my producer surplus. But we've introduced a third party into this, the government. The government, they now get a tax revenue from this, and that's going to be a surplus benefit for this economy. So PW plus tariff minus PW equals tariff. So the vertical difference between these two curves is going to be the per unit tax. Now a tariff is only on imported goods, so we're going to do this based on the imported Q4 to Q3 value. And so there's our tax revenue. What do you notice about that purple area? We still have two leftover little spots on there. Those purple areas are our dead weight loss, the inefficiency or the efficiency lost by having this tax revenue started. We talk about deadweight loss first when we start talking about price floors and price ceilings, and here we see it again, that there's an efficiency loss when this is occurring. Now, to kind of clarify this graph, here it is again. So with the tariff, we have this new consumer surplus, this new producer surplus. We can see the tax revenue on here and the deadweight loss and the imported goods. There's not much else to say about this. It just kind of highlights these things. And so if you can understand how we came over these areas, you're all good. With that said, we're just changing gears really drastically and talking about comparative advantage. So previously on comparative advantage, we discussed the outputs. You can produce this much corn, this much wheat, this much m and m Skittles, whatever you're talking about. Sometimes, though, we want to look at the inputs, this many hours worked, this many number of workers used to produce this one good. It's always assumed to be production of one good. So it's going to be a slight variation of what we have been talking about. Now, a phrase I heard a long time ago is input goes over, output goes under. So if you want to kind of write that down, that's totally fine. Uh, I'm going to mention kind of how this works in a little bit later. So let's go through a little example. So I used to have two cats, Harley and Zoe. Harley is this one on the left, the Calico, and we have Zoe over here. And so I make the questions, you get a look at my cats, and there you go. So the cats, uh, they have labor time for the animals below. They used to catch mice and birds. Here we go, just made up some numbers for us. Harley can catch mice in 10 minutes, one mouse in 10 minutes, and one bird in 20 minutes. So we have our uh, cost over there. Zoe, that's this one over here, the cute little one, uh, she would take 10 minutes to catch one mouse or five minutes to catch one bird. So this looks a little different than it used to when we talked about the outputs. So which cat has the absolute advantage in catching birds? It's going to be Zoe. Why? Again, opportunity cost, and or rather absolute advantages, who can do it the best? And the best is the least amount of time. Five minutes is less than 20 minutes. You want the lower numbers. In the output questions, the number of Skittles or M&Ms or whatever you're talking about, you want to be able to produce the most. Now you want the lowest numbers, the most efficient use. Okay, but how about comparative advantage? What we're going to do is we're actually going to change this into an output question. Consider how much time it takes, for instance, hardly to catch one mouse. It takes her 10 minutes. The question is going to be, if instead she had devoted that same 10 minutes to catching birds, how many could she have caught? That's the opportunity cost. She devoted 10 minutes to one, therefore that's 10 minutes not going towards the other. This is where that output or input goes over phrase comes in handy. So we have her phrase, 10 minutes, input goes over. For every 10 minutes, she can catch one mouse. Input goes over. It's just a literal statement of what you do. So for every one mouse that Harley's catching, she would give up a half of a bird. How about for Zoe? For every one mouse, meaning for every 10 minutes, she could have caught, well, it takes her five minutes to catch one bird, so in 10 minutes she could have caught two. We've now seen this before. This is an output question. And so we can see that Harley has a lower opportunity cost. She gives up a half a bird to get to one mouse compared to Zoe, who has two. And so we have our comparative advantage numbers. 
Now this is where College Board typically pauses. Um, you might do uh, terms of trade, um, but usually you don't go into economic gains. With that said, I'm still going to go through that. So a typical example would be something like, let's say the two cats had 40 minutes. What would they have gained by trading with each other? They got along. You can see they're best of friends. First thing, turn the question into an output question. So I went ahead and these are the specialized numbers. Harley's doing mice, Zoe's doing birds. So if 10 minutes catches one mouse in 40 minutes, how many mice could Harley have caught? Answer, four. For Zoe, it takes her five minutes to catch one bird. She gets 40 minutes. Therefore, how many birds could she have caught? Eight. All right, so there's my output. Now we've seen this question before. We've done this kind of economic gains. First thing we need to do, figure out the terms of trade. How do you do that? You look at the opportunity cost. So you're going to look at that chart from earlier, down here on the left. One mouse should trade for more than half of a bird. So there's my range right here. And less than two, because always Zoe's not going to agree to this. And so the terms of trade, I just pick a nice easy number. One to one sounds good to me. Next, number of trades. Well, what we're going to do is figure out how many times can they all trade. So Harley has four mice available to her. She trades one mouse per trade, so she can trade four times. Zoe has eight birds available to her. She would trade one bird, and so she can trade eight times. The lower of the two numbers are the number of trades. If you're not sure about this, the simplest way to think about this is let's say that you had $4 and I had $8. After four trades, I'm not going to trade another dollar with you. You don't have anything left. So I'm going to trade with you four times, dollar for dollar. I'm not going to give you a fifth dollar just because. So lower the two numbers is the number of trades. What do we do next? Plug in. So we're going to plug in the terms of trade and the number of trades, which I wrote right there. We are doing four trades at a one-to-one -one ratio. Because it's just one-to-one, -one, I didn't worry about the, the units or anything else. So after four trades, Harley's going to trade those four mice. Those are going to travel over to Zoe. In exchange, Zoe's going to travel, take those four birds, put it over here, sum those up, and you end up with those numbers. Great. Now what do you do? Well, remember, you start out with 40 minutes of work time. So what we're going to do is we're going to change these outputs back into an input question. So what I'm going to do is I have the, the chart from the first part of this. And I'm going to multiply these numbers by what we looked at. So at zero, uh, Harley has zero mice. Okay, that doesn't matter. So Harley has four my, uh, four birds, and that used to take her 20 minutes. So that's a quote saying she has 80 minutes worth of birds available to her. She only worked 40. Zoe has four mice. Each mouse would have taken 10 minutes to catch. That's 40 minutes of, of, of mice available. She caught, has four birds, and each bird would have taken five minutes. So Harley has the equivalent of 80 minutes worth of work. Zoe has the equivalent of 60 minutes worth of work. They only both worked 40 minutes. So how many minutes did they gain? 80 minus 40. Harley gained 40 minutes. 60 minus 40. Zoe gained 20 minutes. So Harley made out better. She was honestly, let's be just fair, she was the smarter of the two cats. But those are the economic gains. Now if I talk about them as a community, I could add these up and say they gained 60 minutes by working with each other. All right. Hope that works. And until next time, bye.